I'm so happy to be here with Jane Robbins Mize and with Davy Niddle. Jane Robbins, hello. Hello. And Davy, hello. How are you? Hey, Al. We have a poem by Laylee Long Soldier. It's called Talent. And it's, um, well, arguably four lines, arguably four stanzas, but anyway, four sections. So we're going to go around and, and read the poem, put it into the oral record of those who are watching this video, and then we're going to talk about it for a little bit. So Davey's going to do the first section or stanza, then Jane Robbins, and then I, and then back to Davey. So Davey, when you're ready. Talent by Lily Longsolder. My first try, I made a hit. It dropped from morning gray, the smallest shadow. Both wings slipped inward mid-flight. The man barked. Now I shot again and again a third time with each arrow through the target. I thought, was it luck or was it skill? Luck or skill as the last one fell. Its awkward shape made me run there, pulsing on the ground. I was astounded by its size. A gangly white goose throbbed, heaved its head. My eyes dropped blood flowers opened in the snow of its neck behind my shoulder stepping down from a yellow bus child made their way across the field i shot once more to end it quickly close range its death did i do this to spare the bird from suffering or to spare the children the sight my motives in humid cold yes my knuckles in the cold steamed bright red because on my stomach, in grass, in rubber boots, pockets, and vests, I slid along with that hunter I did as he directed from quiver, my draw, my black lashes in steely-eyed release. It felt good there. It felt strong. My breath in autumn was an animal there. I thought, did I really do this? Did I Really, yet what difference is muscle is an arrow powered upward or any flight to center when I did not hear it, though I clearly mouthed, poor thing, poor thing, poor thing. Davy, there's, I'm um, going to ask you a kind of big, obvious question. There's tension here. There's mixed feelings. Can you describe those mixed feelings? Sure. I mean, the, the mixed feelings, um, my thought is about human non-human relation. As you can hear the non-human relation of my next door neighbor's puppy, who's kind of appropriate to this moment, um, <laughs> uh, who's sharing in this moment with us. And I think that the tension in the poem, as I understand it, is about what kind of relation to have to the non-human. What does it mean to learn a skill, to have talent for um, killing birds, uh, for being good at something that you maybe think is an unethical thing to do? Mm. Jane Robbins, how would you read the tension or um, ambivalence? I definitely agree with Davy, And I also think that there might be some tension between the speaker and the man who is guiding the speaker on this hunt. Um, it seems like the speaker is compelled to shoot because the man barks now because he's directing uh, the speaker to pull an arrow from their quiver. Um, so there's a tension between the, the speaker's agency and the situation in which they find themselves. The speaker seems to be in, let's just say, middle generation. The speaker seems to be guided by the man who seems to be more expert. So the speaker seems to be somewhat apprenticed or learning or guided. But then there are children behind that. So I'm really interested in the man. I mean, the man is a very loaded phrase in American English, referring to a boss and usually in the context of someone from whom you are alienated, someone who's in too much control. Um, does that obtain, Davy? And am I right to think about this person as kind of caught in the middle? I'm supposed to learn, but I also have to worry about how violent this is and what it's doing to the people behind me. Yeah, I have, I have two thoughts about that. Um, tell me if this seems right to y'all. I'm just trying to work through this thought. I think my impression is that the man is the only gendered language in the poem. We don't get a gender for the speaker. We get the language of the child thinking about a child or a group of children stepping down from this yellow bus. And I'm like the queer ecologies part of my brain is tempted to think about the man and then like, 
all non-cis male and non-human relation as being other than this cis masculine, I'm assuming cis masculine figure. And so I'm having that thought about like, what kind of, what does it mean to have this singular gendered figure in relation with all of these non-gendered figures, but then also a kind of alternate pedagogy happening. So Jane Robbins, I'm thinking about what you were saying about being, about the speaker being told to shoot, about this kind of pedagogy happening of being uh, taught how to do this activity, to do this, this activity of shooting, but then also a kind of pedagogical role taking place to shield the child or children coming down from the bus and at once receiving one form of teaching and wanting to engage in a really different form of teaching at the same time. That, like, that's part of the tension too, of wanting to be a really different teacher than you are um, interpolated as a student. Jane Robbins, let me um, form uh, a chance for you to respond to what Davy just said through a question, which is about the third sentence or line or stanza, child made their way Again, avoiding the need, using their, avoiding the need to gender the child. Child made their way across the field. I shot once more to end it quickly. So what you have there is a decision to spare the child, but of course not to spare the animal. There's a decision being made, as if to put it out of its misery, but also to spare the bird from suffering. It's a very complicated bit of violence. Yeah, I think that, that this line you're pointing us to, it could be read as a moment where the title talent is uh, becoming or is blooming or becoming more ambiguous. Um, we see the speaker having the talent for shooting once more and ending it quickly for, for being a good shot and killing the bird, uh, but also a talent for care, for noticing what this child might need in this moment and for offering it in the best way that they know how in this moment. So there's a kind of collision here that, that feels like the central um, ambiguity or tension mm. that we've been talking about. Davy, I, I want to interpose and perhaps not helpfully, but interpose vocabulary we use in Modpo about subjectivity and objectivity. It's, it seems clear that one, and then you let the record show that you chose this poem for us to talk about. And I think one of the reasons why it's in conversation with the issue of modern poetry is modern poetry aspires to an intersubjectivity. Certainly when you get from, let's say, Ezra Pound's The Encounter, which is about a guy looking at a woman and basically rendering her into a Japanese paper napkin, you move to Lynn Hedginian, who is through experimental narrative, trying to create a young personhood that is interacting with the reader who has to help piece it together. So there you get to supposed intersubjectivity. This poem kind of makes all of that very complicated because the object is, is about to be dead animal. That's the object of the shooting. So this is kind of like the human as settler colonialist killing animals as a quote unquote natural skill to learn if you live this kind of life. And I think that the speaker is struggling with the idea that there's subjectivity there as well. And there's conflicting subjectivities. What the heck do I do? How did I do in trying to render the conversation back to subjectivity and objectivity? I think great. And I also think that the question of the relationship between killing and colonization is really complicated for thinking about Lily Long Soldier as an indigenous poet and as a poet who writes a lot about indigenous identification and of thinking about um, the killing of this bird as necessarily, you know, in the larger arc of this particular collection of poems of, of whereas, of being embedded in like Death is not separate. Death and killing are not separable from legacies of colonization and the on an ongoing present of settler colonialism. Uh, but if we take the speaker to be um, an indigenous person, um, that might shape how we read um, the politics and tension around killing. And that's a question that we could ask and something that would be interesting to think through. Another element that I'm thinking of, Al, with a sort of genealogy that you're drawing out about subjectivity is in this fourth section or stanza, um, the line, it felt strong, my breath in autumn was an animal there, I thought, did I really do this? 
And I keep thinking about the phrase, my breath in autumn was an animal there. Um, and that there's an identification between the way of, this is a kind of, this poem facilitates and thinks about a moment that is a kind of intimacy with the non-human, that like something that the speaker really likes is like, I got to be really, really proximate to these forms of uh, non-human life. I got to be with these animals. Uh, and there was something really generative about that. But in the course of being with them, I killed them. Yeah. And I think that that the kind of this is asking us questions about like, OK, like these questions about intersubjectivity that we're asking over the arc of the course. Um, to what to what degree do they extend to the non-human and to what degree is the subject always embedded in a canon of U.S. poetry in questions of colonization? Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Jane Robbins, what I want to do is give you an opportunity to say anything in response to what David just said. And then we're going to do a lightning round about how this poem is written in particular and why. So any thoughts on what David just said, Jane Robbins? Definitely. I think um, this final stanza that David pointed us to, I'm thinking about the final refrain, poor thing, poor thing, poor thing, as expressing that uh, conflation of the subject and the object in this poem, or, or what appears to be a conflict over the conflation of the subject and the object. Mm -hmm. uh, poor thing is a phrase we use when we're empathizing with an object, giving it subjectivity through that empathy. Uh, and yet it's still, it's still, of course, uses the word thing, which is an objectifying word. So that right. feels like a very intentional and um, profound phrasing to, to end this That's poem. really quite brilliant. And, and I think that um, thing, unless you put the idiomatic phrasing of poor in front of it, almost any other time in English, thing is very thingy, very object, object very other. But poor thing is all about empathy. We would say that about a child or about a dog that's whimpering because it stepped on a thorn. Um, there's a lot of mm -hmm. poor thing. Okay, so here's the lightning round. We'll go around starting with Davy. Um, if somebody said, okay, I get it. I get what this is about. I'm really interested in this poem, but why is it written this way? Why is it written specifically this way? Which of course obliges you to say what this way is. So what would you say for starters, Davy? I think about this poem as being written in a way that produces a tension between order and disorder. So we get these four carefully ordered stanzas and with them, this uh, one kind of, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say Steinian, you can um, push me on it um, and I would appreciate that um, kind of uh, Steinian, like continuous present um, procedure of uh, this thought that is at once a set of observations and a sense of somatic perceptions, the inside and the outside in the poem between what's happening in the speaker's body and mind and what they're observing uh, are all conflated. And I think that, um, I think of the stanzas in the shape of the poem as a desire to um, delineate an experience, a disordering experience, an experience that can't form a clear relation in terms of gender, in terms of subject and object, in terms of uh, empathy and alienation, um, those aren't clear categories here. And I think that um, the act of trying to contain the language in stanzas, but then to like endlessly spill over the lines and stanzas to have this kind of continuation that cuts against the structure of the, the visual structure of the poem, I think is a way of um, refusing a logic of order, even as it's trying to visually produce it. So, in other words, Lely Long Soldier is not choosing to write periodic sentences that have an end, they have a subject object, a predicate that follows the subject, a th something that's being done to something else, which is why we call direct objects, direct objects, that whole uh, objecthood. To do that would be to create a, a virulent irony uh, and basically to do the kind of hunting that, if I may be so momentarily radical, that the hunting that sentence that traditional 18th century and beyond sentences in English typically do. What's the opposite of that? Whatever the non-periodic sentence is, and you described it so well. 
So that's pretty radical stuff. And I think Stein does lead toward that, even if Stein herself doesn't do it so much. Jane Robbins, this is a lightning round. Your answer to the question, somebody comes up to you and says, why? But yeah, okay, I get it. But why is it written exactly this way? Well, I would just add to Davy's interpretation, which I think is really persuasive, that just the factor of time. Um, I kind of see this as a poem in four acts. And I think of a moment that is profound and life-changing as this one that ends the life um, and perhaps changes the course of the speaker's life. Um, time slows down in moments like that. And we see a, a, a loose narrative uh, unfolding in this poem over the course of four stanzas uh, that give you a kind of um, rapid fire snapshot of, of the speaker's consciousness uh, in each of those moments. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. We, can you be in all the videos? <laughs> that was really, <laughs> I'll do my, I'll do my take on this question. My, the question I myself asked, <laughs> and then we'll just do final thoughts. We'll go around and do final thoughts. Okay. I, my answer to the question, I agree with what you both said. Um, and I, what I would focus on is the bark, the man barked now. Um, that is very, um, it is a very definite and also happens to have all the, all the needed tools to be a sentence in itself, the man barked. Um, and this is such, so not a barking poem. This poem kind of surrounds that bark with whatever the opposite of barking is in a language. So think about bar something barking that's an antonymic to words like on my stomach and grass and rubber boots, pockets and vests, I slid. I mean, just slid versus bark, right? I slid along with that hunter. I did as he directed from quiver my draw, my black lashes in steely eyed release. It felt good there. There it felt strong. My breath in autumn was an animal. It's almost as if this person is now breathing with the animal or like an animal. And of course, humans are animals. And that breath is the in out of the way the writing goes. There's no barking in, in, in the way um, living beings breathe. And the poem is much more like the living breathing, breathe breathing, the living being breathing than it is like barking orders. So that would be my contribution to that. Okay, final thoughts, Davy first. Then Jane Roberts. My final thought is about firstness, about the first three words of the poem, my first try. And um, the reason that I'm, I'm thinking about them and as they've you know, ev evaded our conversations, there's so much happening in this poem and so much to talk about is that um, I read that moment as a moment in which the first time you try something, you don't necessarily understand what it, the implications are of the action that you're taking. The first time in this case, the speaker is shooting an arrow they don't necessarily associate the ending of a life with that action. I'm being taught to do this skill. I'm being taught this procedure. I'm being taught this physical form. Um, and thinking about those kind of uh, routines or rituals rather than I'm engaging in an action that has um, a certain implication that's going to do a certain kind of thing. And uh, it's that shift that I think the poem documents so well between uh, learning how to take an action and learning what the implication of the action is, uh, mm -hmm. such that taking the action is never the same ever again. And it's that it's that transformation of learning about the impact of a particular action that I think is like maybe why this moment, um, why this moment is so impactful, why it slows down the way it does, as Jane Robbins, you were so beautifully describing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Davey. Jane Robbins, final thought. Ah, I will do my final thought because Jane Robbins seems to have frozen darn Zoom. Um, my final thought is about the title. I think, you know, we wouldn't have a Modpo video without somebody saying something specifically about the metapoetic quality of any piece. We've already sort of done that anyway in talking about form and content. But I think talent here, there is plentiful talent on show here. And whether 
whether this was luck or skill, it's pretty clear that shooting, learning to shoot could be luck or skill and those two categories can merge. But talent is what you get when you write a poem this interesting. So we've lost um, our friend Jane Robbins Mize, but we're gonna say goodbye on her behalf. And Davey, thank you so much for not only participating in this discussion, but for, for leading us to this poem. And here comes Jane Robbins to say goodbye. Jane Robbins, can you unmute? There you are. Hi, how are you? Hi, Great. so you sorry wanna, about that. No, it's the way things work these days. Do you want a, do you want a final thought? Sure. Um, my final thought is about syllables. I haven't worked through this entirely, but I feel like there's something really masterful happening with the use of syllables in this poem. I was so struck when Davey read, read the first stanza that the first one, two, three, four. My first try, I made a hit. It dropped from 10 syllables are individual words. And I think by the end, the, the uh, words become more syllabic and we move from a kind of instantaneous experience to something a bit more reflective uh, at the same time. So I haven't thought through it, but it's something that would be fun to keep thinking about. Yeah, I'd love to explore that we don't have time for it. The relationship between the deployment of muscle of a body and breathing, which by the way, I don't know anything about using a bow and arrow, but clearly you have to really control your breath in order to do it well. So did I really yet, what difference is muscle? Is an arrow mm. powered upward? You, at this point, you don't know who the animal is and who's learning to breathe naturally and who's crawling around on the ground. Pretty cool. Jane Robbins, thank you for being part of this discussion. And Davey, as always. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Al.